Okay. Taking, um, taking your lead, I decided to uh, try to explore a little bit of the uh, essential uh, mood and some of the topics of the Das Avatar. So um, I'll speak about Das Avatar, but I'll preface it with a few other points. Omagyan, Timirandasya, Gyananjana Salakaya, Chaksurundari Tanyaya Tasma, Sri Gurudeva Maha, Ma Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthai Bhutale, Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Kinamine. Namaste, said as what did they they go to the body for chatting and you say, so soon your body was kept the other days in Tarine. Bunch of copper to Rupes Chak, Rupes Sindhu Bay, Pachapatitanam, Bhavane Bill, Vaishnava, Bill, the Mahona Maha, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu, Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadad, Har, Sri Vasa de Gaur, Bhaktivinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Um, so the, the Vedic scriptures in general, particularly the Puranas, uh, mention that uh, the incarnations of the Lord are as numerous or more numerous than the grains of sands on all the beaches of the world more numerous than the amount of snowflakes that were ever, that have ever fell from the sky, more numerous than the waves of an ocean, which continually is pounding its waters on the shore. The Lord is unlimited and everything connected with him has the same unlimited nature. So when it comes to appearances and manifestations, incarnations, avatars, they are innumerable, but they're categorized into six main categories. And they are called um, Purusha avatars, Leela avatars, Manvantara avatars, um, Guna avatars, Shaktivesh avatars, and one more, um, uh, I can't remember the, the sixth category, but there are six categories of avatars. And we'll be speaking about Leela avatars. Leela simply means the Lord's pastimes. And as we mentioned, these incarnations of the Lord, or the word avatar is specifically used in this connection, which means one who descends. The word avatar means he who descends. Who well, he who comes from the spiritual into the material in order to benefit the material or benefit those persons in the material world. Um, the Leela avatars are the Das avatars, and Das avatars is a particular stotra. It's called Das avatar stotra, written by one particular uh, very elevated personality named Jayadev Goswami, who took the, wrote this as part of the um, bigger text that he wrote when that was called the Gita Govinda, which is about more the more uh, secret or intimate pastimes of Krishna and Sri Vrindavan with his intimate associates, particularly the gopis of Vrindavan. But in this particular section of the Das Avatar Shrotra, he mentions, as it mentions, 10 avatars. And they're sequential in their appearance, and they're also sequential in categories of species. Because it also mentions in the Shastras that 
there are 8,400,000 species of life categorized into five groups known as aquatics, trees, plants, insects, uh, beasts, and human forms. The human forms have are 400,000 human forms. And this means throughout all the material universes, not just this particular universe. Versus also, sometimes it's given the example, and if you have a, a jar of mustard seeds, you can't count the amount of mustard seeds, they're so small. In fact, they're so small, if you drop one on the floor, you'll find a hard, have a hard time finding it. But if you have one big jar full of mustard seeds, there are innumerable mustard seeds there. So the universes are compared to a jar of mustard seed all clustered up together, which makes up the entire material existence, which is one fourth of the entire existence. There are the other three fourths are the manifestations of the spiritual world, which are eternal. The, the universes in the material sense are all temporary and they go through the process of creation, development, and ultimately pralaya or annihilation according to the universal clock. So the Lord appears in these, uh, in these material universes to perform different pastimes. And it says in the Bhagavad Gita, Yada, Yada, Hidharmasya, Glanir Bhavati Bharata, Abhutanam, Adharmasya, Tadatmaham, Srijamiyaham, Pavitranaya, Sarunam, Vinashtanaya, Chaduskritam, Dharma, Samstar, Padartaya, Kam, Sambhavami, Yuye, Yuye. The Lord speaks this in Bhagavad Gita, in the fourth chapter, where he describes why he appears in this world. And he gives us three reasons. One, when irreligious principles become so strong and religion is practically lost, the Lord appears to re-resurrect re religious principles and to eliminate the irreligious factor. In other words, getting rid of killing the demons. And then the, the third part is that he comes to give pleasure to his devotees, and that's the main reason. So in this Das, das Arvasar Sutra, we're going through the different species and gradations of species, from the lower forms of species to the more higher forms as the, as the verses continue on. And the first one is the fish incarnation known as Matsya. And uh, the fist incarnation, and uh, I'll read the uh, Sanskrit. In fact, if you allow me, I'll try to chant it in the meter that it's described in. And this is from Jayadev Govinda's Das Sutra. And in this uh, chanting, it describes a little bit about what's uh, this particular manifestation or incarnation is. It goes, Palaya Prayudi Jala Dritta Vanasa Sivehitam Vihita Paritra Charitram Makehidam Kesava Dritta Nina Sarira Jai Jagadisa Hare and the translation to that is, I'll read it here. It says, O Keshava, O Lord of the universe, O Lord Hari, you have assumed the form of a fish. All glories unto you. You easily acted as a boat in the form of a giant fish just to give protection to the Vedas, which had become immersed in the turbulent sea of devastation. So in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the eighth canto, it describes this appearance of the Matsya avatar and how one great devotee named Satyavati Muni orchestrated the arrangement that the Lord had wanted by connecting him, the Lord, who was who came in the form of this gigantic 
gigantic fish. He was millions of miles long. And uh, the Lord saved the Vedas from being lost during this devastation. And then along with many great sages and such a Muni, the Lord uh, plied his way through the devastating ocean and uh, eventually the water receded, the Vedas were saved, and the Lord's purpose was achieved. Now, this is a, the first of this 10 avatars. It's called Matsya. Matsya in Sanskrit, or in, in, in Sanskrit, means simply means fish. It's the fifth incarnation of the Lord. And you can read it. It's in the very last chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam in the eighth canto. Describes in detail the entire pastime. For the second incarnation, and I'll also chant the Sanskrit for that. It says, Shitti iha vipuda tare tishta. Shitti iha vipuda tare tishta da tava prihiste. Dharani dharana kinka chakra gadiste. Keshava drita kurma sarira. Jai Jagati Sahare. This one describes the fishing as uh, the turtle incarnation or tortoise. And it says, O Keshava, O Lord of the universe, O Lord Hari, who have assumed the form of a tortoise, all glories unto you. In this incarnation as a divine tortoise, the great Mandara mountain rests upon your gigantic back as a pivot for churning the ocean of milk. From holding it up, the huge mounting, a large scar-like depression is put in your back, which has become most glorious. So during the churning of the ocean of milk between the demigods and the demons, when they had to churn with the Mandara hill, both holding different sides of the Vasuki snake as the churning rope, uh, the mountain was unsteady. And so in order for the mountain to become steady, the Lord appeared in this form as a tortoise and he became the pivot by which the mountain rests upon. And in doing that, the demons and the, the, the demigods made a truce and turned the ocean of milk in order to get the nectar. And that is in the eighth canto also, Srimad Bhagavatam, beginning around chapter... Um, I believe chapter 15, beautiful, all the men, many of the many incarnations of the Lord, which are famous, such as Danvantari, Lakshmi Devi, and many other manifestations of the Lord appear during that uh, churning of the milk ocean. One of the most uh, glorious pastimes. It's also the time where Lord Shiva. Right? It's also the time where Lord Shiva drank an ocean of poison in order to save the world. And he is called Nila Kanta or Kala Kanta. He has a mark on his neck, which is the indication of his saving the world from destruction by drinking the ocean of poison that appeared during the beginning of the churning of the milk ocean. Not an ocean of poison, but deadly poison, which came out. It was called Kalahuta. It was so strong that it was able to destroy the whole universe. Lord Shiva saved it. So that was um, the second incarnation in this Das Avatar. And I'll read the third. Vasati dasana sikare dharani tavalagnam. Shashini Kalanka Kaliva Nimahunam Keshava Drita Sukara Rupa Jai Jagadi Sahare Sukara Rupa refers to, we'll read the translation here, O Keshava, O Lord of the Universe, O Lord Hari, you have assumed the form of a boar. All glories unto you. The earth, which has become immersed in the Garbodak ocean at the bottom of the universe, sits fixed upon the tip of your tongue like a spot 
upon the moon. A huge manifestation of the Lord's appearance in the form of a gigantic boar. Uh, this happened many, many millions and millions of years ago when Harani Kashipu and Harani Aksha were on the planet. And Harani Aksha, a great powerful demon, was exploiting the earth for gold because of that exploitation. The earth lost its balance within the universe and fell into the lower part of the universes in the Garbadak Ocean. And it was immersed there. The Lord was petitioned by the demigods to save the earth. And he appeared in his very powerful form. First, he appeared in the, from the nostril of Lord Brahma as a little tiny gourd, and he grew as big as the sky. And in that incarnation, he picked up the earth with his tusks and saved it from being destroyed. And then, and later on, he killed the demon Haranyaksha in a great battle, which is described in detail in the third canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. That's a beautiful, beautiful narration of the Lord as he has he appeared. A boar is not a very beautiful animal, but when the Lord takes the form of a boar, he, be, he becomes very, very beautiful. And uh, why did he assume the form of a boar? Because the bottom of the ocean is considered to be a filthy place. So in order to be appropriate for his mission, he, formed, he appeared as a boar because boars go into filthy places like that. So the Lord, and there's many, many wonderful uh, benefits that happened during that pastime, how Mother Earth was blessed by the touch of the Lord and how she blossomed from that. Um, and there are much more details to that, but we can read it from the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Number four is um, this one we're all familiar with. Familiar with. Tavakada Kamala Varena Kamad Bhutta Sringam Dolita Hiranya Kashi Putanu Bringam Keshavadrita Narahari Rupa Jai Jagadisa. So here we go in our Krishna conscious movements. We regularly chant the glories of Lord Nishringadev. And as it's mentioned here, O Keshava, Lord of the universe, O Lord Hari, you have assumed the form of half man, half lion. All glories unto you, just as one can easily crush a wasp between one's fingernails. So in the same way, the body of the wasp-like demon Haraji Kashipu has been ripped apart by the wonderful pointed nails on your beautiful lotus hands. And that is a beautiful, amazing, glorious pastime of the Lord, which appears in the seventh canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, taking up mostly of the whole seventh canto. It is such a detailed explanation of the glories of the pure devotee Sri Prahlad Maharaj, who worshipped the Lord and was saved by the Lord from his demoniac father, Harani Kashipu, who tried to kill him in so many ways. Narani Kashipu had become powerful by austerities and penances and by the benedictions of Lord Brahma that he was, he had usurped the entire universe. The Lord appeared when he saw his devotee was being harassed too much and he appeared in his wonderful form, keeping all the benedictions of Lord Brahma intact he killed the demon Rani Kashipu. Rani Kashipu had made so many arrangements on how he could avoid being killed. And he thought of every way a person could be killed. And therefore he, he received that benediction. But the Lord is the most intelligent. Anyone who thinks that they, uh, they can outsmart the Lord will be, out, will be uh, outsmarted themselves. <laughs> 
the Lord is the, is the supreme intelligence of all intelligence and he can do anything. <laughs> and so keeping the benedictions of his devotee, Lord Brahma, he killed the powerful demon Harani Kashipu and saved his son, Prahlad Maharaj. And so that one, that particular pastime is Srila Prabhupada's favorite pastime. He spoke about it at least three or four different times during his appearance with us. And especially in his last days before he departed on the planet, from the planet, he spoke this uh, pastime again, just to emphasize the glories of Prahlad Maharaj. So we can learn about that from that. in the appearance day of Lord Vishringadev is coming up on the 25th of this month, which is exactly, uh, hmm, it's only 10 days away. So this is the day where devotees all around the world perform great celebrations in honor of the appearance of Lord Vishringadev. And in each temple, there are narrations of the Lord's activities uh, so please take advantage of this upcoming holiday of the appearance of Lord Nishringa Dev. That's the fourth incarnation, and I'll read the fifth one. Chalayasi Vikrama Balim Abhuta Bhavana Paranaka Nija Janita Janapahavana Kesha Vratrita Bamana Rupa Jai Jagadisahare. O Keshava, O Lord of the universe, O Lord of who have assumed the form of a dwarf Brahman, all glories to you. O wonderful Dwight, by your massive steps you deceive King Bali, and by the Ganga water which has emanated from the nails of your lotus feet. To deliver all living beings within this world. So this is a very essential pastime, which is mentioned again in the eighth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's one of the most important pastimes of the Lord. How the Lord um, took away the property of the demon Bali Maharaj, who had usurped the entire three worlds. By his power, he, he defeated the demigods headed by King Indra, and he subjugated all the properties of the world. He was now the most powerful person. Bali had a tendency towards charity. When, when he would see Brahmanas, he offered charity to, to Brahmanas. Although he was of the demonic nature, still he respected and honored uh, Brahmanas. So Brahmana Dev appeared within the assembly of Bali as a dwarf Brahmana, small little boy, wearing a deer skin and a Brahman thread. And uh, Bali offered him any benediction he wanted. And the Lord asked simply for three steps of land. In those three steps, the Lord expanded himself. He is called uh, Vikrama, Vikrama, another name for the Lord. And uh, Upendra, that's another name for Ramana. He took, in two steps, he took the entire universe back and gave it back to the demigods. Bali surrendered to the Lord. The Lord blessed Bali by giving him a kingdom in the lower planets called Sutala. And the Lord agreed to become his doorkeeper in that. So Bali is actually a great devotee who was transformed by the Lord. Uh, so that's a wonderful, really wonderful pastimes. And the appearance of Ganga Devi in this world was due to Bali, was due to, I'm sorry, was due to Vamana Dev when he kicked his foot up, he punctured the coverings of the universe and the Ganga, which was flowing in the higher planets, flowed now down into the lower planets. And it was caught on the head of Lord Shiva and saved from going all the way down to the lower planets. So that Ganga River 
rests on the head of Lord Shiva, but it was brought by the toe of, of uh, Vamana. So that's why one of the reasons why the Ganga River is so holy, because the water has washed the feet of the Supreme Lord himself. So anyone who bathes in the Ganga, worships the Ganga, gets much, much spiritual mercy, blessings, and uh, purification of heart and mind. So that was uh, the fifth incarnation. So we'll go on to the next one. And this is Kshatriya Rudira Manya Jagat Apagata Apapam Sapaya Sapaya Sasami Bhavatapam Keshavatrita Brigupati Rupam Jai Jagadish Sahade O Lord of the Universe, O Lord Hari, who have assumed the form of Brigupati, Parasuram, all glories unto you. At Kurukshetra, you bathe the earth in the river of blood from the bodies of the demoniac kshatriyas that you have slain. The sins of the world are washed away by you, and because of you, people are relieved from the blazing fire of material existence. So here we hear about Brigupati Parasuram, who was an incarnation of the Lord in order to destroy the demoniac kings who were real ruling the world. It says that he killed the Kshatriya kings, 21 generations. And then later on, religious uh, rule was established in the world. Parasuram is known as a very fierce manifestation of the Lord. He carries a chopper and he was able to wield that chopper, killing the demons as fast as the speed of mind. No one can understand how fast the speed of mind is. If you're sitting in one place, just say we're sitting here and you're, we're in London or wherever we are, and we think of India, some place in India, that is the speed of the mind, how fast that mind, mind can go from one place to another. In the material sense, there's nothing faster than the speed of mind. The speed of the wind is slower than the speed of the mind. The speed of light is even slower, but the highest speed is the speed of the mind. So Brigupati Parasaram was wheeling his chopper at that speed, killing all the uh, uh, demoniac kings in the form of rulers who were sucking the earth for all its natural resources and exploiting the population. So then you can read a little bit about, that's also, that's in the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the story of Parasaram. Now we go to the next one. Vittarasi Diksa Rama Dikpati Kamaniyam Dasamukam Malam Pali Ramaniyam Keshavadrita Rama Sarira Jai Jagadisa Hare. So, here, O Keshava, Lord of the Universe, O Lord Hari, who have assumed the form of Ramachandra, all glories to you in the Battle of Lanka, you destroy the ten headed demon Ravana and, distri and distribute his heads as a delightful offering to the presiding deities of the ten directions headed by Indra. This action was long desired by all of them who were very much harassed by this monster. So now we all know the Ramayan, the story of Lord, the appearance of Lord Ramachandra, which happened about 2 million years ago in the Treta Yuga. Um, I think the, the, there's nothing I can really say. Everyone is pretty much familiar of the Ramayan. Valmiki's Ramayan describing the beautiful pastime of the Lord how he lived a righteous life and at the same time brought religion back where it was supposed to be by destroying personification of irreligion, Ravana. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful pastime. 
You can also read about it in the ninth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam chapters number nine and ten, I believe, in that particular canto. And of course, I think we all have some exposure to to uh, Ramachandra's pastimes. It's very, very beautiful, very extensive. And it's known in many countries around the world, not only in the Holy Land of India. Okay, number eight. Vahasiva pusa visade vasanan jaladahabam alahati biti milite jamunahabam keshavadrita O Kesh, the Lord of the universe, the Lord Hari, who have assumed the form of Balaram, the wielder of the plow, all glories to you. On your brilliant white body, you wear garments the color of a fresh blue cloud. These garments are colored like the beautiful hue of the Jamuna River, who feels great fear due to your striking of your plow shell. So although Balaram is considered to be the Supreme Personality of Godhead in his absolute form, he also appears as a Leela avatar to assist Lord Krishna in his pastimes when he appears in this world as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So here it mentions uh, a little bit about his description. He carries a plow. He carries a club. The plow is called Haladar. The club is called Sumanda. These two of the uh, paraphernalia of the Supreme Lord. And when he was about to bathe in the Jamuna River, she refused to give him entrance. And therefore, the Lord Balaram took his plowshare and bisected and bifurcated the river into many streams. And you see, even today, the Jamuna River flows in many, many different directions and many tributaries because of Lord Balaram. And that happened 5,000 years ago. Um, that's a beautiful, beautiful pastime. Eventually, Jamuna appeared to Lord Balaram, offered beautiful prayers, and offered him many wonderful gifts, and uh, worshipped him in so many wonderful ways. And so, uh, that particular pastime is there in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, the appearance of the activities of Lord Balaram, which are very numerous. Number nine. Nindasi yagya vidhe ahaha sruti jahatam sadaya ridaya darsita pasukahatam Keshavadrita Bura Sarihira Jai Jagadisahare. Here's an interesting one. O Keshava, O Lord of the universe, O Lord of we, who have assumed the form of Buddha, all glories to you, O Buddha of compassionate heart. You decry the slaughtering of poor animals performed according to the rules of Vedic sacrifice. So Lord Buddha, the original appearance of Buddha, is actually an incarnation of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, in the covered incarnation, in order to teach or to get people to stop Vedic sacrifices, which were being abused by the people at the time. So the Lord appeared in order to show compassion to the poor animals who were being unnecessarily killed and they were, people were calling it Vedic sacrifices, although they were not qualified to perform the sacrifices. And so the Lord appeared and he is known as compassion personified. Of course, Buddha never appeared as the Lord. He remained in a hidden chana, gupta, manifestation of himself in order to teach the eightfold process of how to live life in a very more morally and religious way. He didn't teach higher religious principles. He taught basic, not basic, but the essence of morality and the essence of morality 
combined with compassion towards all living entities, especially the animals. So the Lord loves all living entities equal, equally, because all living entities are part and parcel of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord is not partial to any living entities. So in order to save the animals from being unnecessarily slaughtered, in the name of religion, he appeared in that form as Buddha. And the story, the life of Buddha is not mentioned in the Bhagavatam, um, but there are other Puranas where you can read about Lord Buddha and his activities. He's mentioned in the first canto, in the third chapter, as one of the series of incarnations that appear. Here is number 10. Alecha vihaha nindane kalaya sakala varam Numaketu iha kim apakarahalam Kesa vadita kauki sari hirahan jai jagati sahare O Keshava, O Lord of the Universe, O Lord Hari, who have assumed the form of Kalti, Kalki, all glories to you. You appear like a comet and carrying a ter terrifying sword for bringing about the annihilation of the wicked barbarian men at the end of Kali Yuga. So that incarnation is yet to appear. It will appear at the end of this Yuga, uh, at the end of Kali Yuga. Prabhupada says at that time, life will be degraded to such such a low level of existence that people will not will be no better than animals uh, it's explained that at that time if someone lives to 25 years old they will be considered to be a grand old man life will be very short and there is no preaching the lord comes on a white horse he carries a sword and he simply kills the demons wholesale. After he does that, he ushers in the next age, which is the Satya Yuga, the golden age. And then uh, after that, life again returns to pure religious prince. So that's about, that will happen at the end of this Yuga, uh, at the end of this age, Kali Yuga which will be hundreds of thousands of years from the present time. So there, these are the ten incarnations of the Lord. There's one more prayer, which I'll mention or sing and give the explanation. And this is in, this mentions the author, Jayadeva Goswami. Sri Jaya Deva Kaveri Idam Uditam Udaram Srinu Sukatam Sukadam Bava Saharam Keshava Trita Dasa Vira Rupa Jai Jagadi Sahare O Keshava, O Lord of the Universe, O Lord Hari, who have assumed these ten different forms of incarnations, all glories to you. O oh, readers, please hear this hymn of the poet Jayadeva, which is most excellent, an awarder of happiness, the bestower of auspiciousness, and is the best thing in this dark world. Hmm. So there is a summation of the of uh, the glories of Jayadeva for presenting these ten incarnations. There's one other prayer, which is a long prayer, which summarizes all the Ten incarnations by listing them all in a very um, simple and direct way. So these are the Das avatars. These are the Leela incarnations, the prime Leela incarnations of the Lord. There are many, many other ones. But these are the ones that are the most prominent. And we honor many of these on certain appearance days, especially Lord Ramachandra, Lord Balaram, uh, Lord... Uh, Lord Varaha and Lord Nishringadev, Lord Vamanadev, all of these that are mentioned, these were these are celebrations that go on in our ISKCON society each year. 
So this is a little bit about these manifestations. As we mentioned, the Lord is unlimited, unlimited, unlimited. He is unlimitedly great. And to get a little indication of his greatness, he appears just to show a little bit about his mercy upon the fallen souls and his compassion towards, towards all living entities. He appears in these different forms and he also does it for his own transcendental pleasure. The Lord never acts outside of that. He enjoys everything he does. He's never, even when he's killing demons, he's happy. <laughs> and the demons get the benediction of getting liberation and they free them from being freed from their demoniac activities. So that is the mercy manifestation of the Lord. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you so much for that, Maharaj. It was a wonderful summary and beautifully sung. Um, glories or uh, prayers of uh, Jay Swami. Um, Maharaj, I have a few questions that uh, I, I'm, I'm, I think they're, they're, they're general questions which most people may have, but if, uh, then we can open up the floor for other questions. But I just have some questions with respect to the Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam talks um, and, and, and tells us about the uh, these avatars, uh, generally speaking. Now, the Bhagavatam is, is presumably a record of our current yuga cycle and the current manvantara in the current day of Brahma. But presumably, each of the avatars are repeating themselves on each of the avatars apart from Krishna. Krishna only appears once in the day of Brahma. Yeah, they appear on different planets throughout the universe to perform their activities. And none of this is in, Bhagavatam is not in chronological order. It's presenting the, the information in a uh, systematic order, which it's not based on chronology, but based on a gradation of spiritual principles till we get to the highest manifestation of the Lord, and that is Krishna, Krishna and Vrindavan in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. so, so the question I had, Maharaj, was um, with each of the four yoga cycles, and we know that there are a thousand such yoga cycles in the day of Brahma. So are these avatars appearing in each of the yoga cycles within the day of Brahma repeatedly? And are the pastimes more or less the same? Um, There are so many manifestations and incarnations within a, a day of Brahma, which can, which day of Brahma consists of four billion three hundred and twenty million years. But these, uh, there's no mention that these they appear in this particular cycle. The what you saw as far as the sequence of narration was based on the species. Yeah, from fish to tortoise, from tortoise to boar, from boar to half man, half lion, from that to dwarf, from dwarf to uncivilized man, from that to to civilized man, to glory, to manifestation of the supreme, to enlightened man, which is Buddha, and then ultimately manifestation as Kothiag avatar as the uh, manifestation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So um, Jayadev Goswami presents it in that order according to the species and not according to chronology. And in the day of Brahma, uh, some of these appear and some of them don't appear. But they're all appearing on different planets throughout the universe at different times. 
So they appear on this planet and then they appear on other planets. So the actual time frame by which they appear is not so clearly given, but they're all appearing at different times throughout the universes, not just this universe. So in a day of Brahma, I mean, there's 71 man manvantaras in one, just simply in one day of Brahma. No, there's more than that. If we got 400 and some, some manvantaras. But in nowhere that I know of, maybe I, my knowledge is not complete, where it describes this going on in a very cyclical form. So when, when at the end of Kalyug, when Satyug re restarts again and, and Treta Yug starts, it's not necessarily the case that Lord Ram will appear in each Treta Yug. Uh, no, that's, yeah, it's not necessarily true. Just like Lord Chaitanya doesn't appear in every Kali Yuga. Krishna appears, seems to appear in every Dwarpa Yuga. Um, on the day of but, Brahma, though, yeah? Yeah, well, if you're talking about on this planet, then uh, hmm, I'm not sure. I can't, I won't take any guesses how they appear, whether they appear in the same way they, they are described in the different yugas, because the, the whole yuga cycle is 4,320,000 years. That's one yuga cycle times 100 becomes 4,320,000,000. And then if you double that one day and night, then it's 8,640,000,000. So some of these manifestations, just like Varaha Dev, he, um, he doesn't, it doesn't mention where he, I mean, he appeared millions and millions of years ago, even before this yuga, this particular yuga cycle took place. And the churning of the milk ocean, that is, I, I, I think it, it, what I, I understand is that these different manifestations of the Lord's appearance are in cycles within the, all of the universes. They appear on this, uni, on this planet, in this universe, and then they go to another planet and appear. And then how long it takes for that evolution to again reappear on this planet after going through all the other universes it doesn't really describe i think there's, there's no particular number that can really account for that and uh, i have a corollary question to that or is that when uh, the lord appears in each of the um the the avatar, uh, Leela avatars, does his associates, are they allocated jivas that raise to that platform that become his associates or are they the same fixed transcendental associates that travel with him to each of the universes? So for instance, Prahlad Maharaj appears here, would he be the same that he appears in another universe? Is it the same personality or is it another jiva that's been promoted like Lord Brahma to that position? I, I would, when the Lord appears, he does come with his entourage from the spiritual world to assist him. But in some cases he appears and then and there are devotees who are already present on the planet who take part in these pastimes also. Uh, for Prahlad Maharaj, it describes how he actually became Prahlad Maharaj. So once one becomes blessed by the Lord, then they can become an eternal associate. But there are some that are eternally his associate, and then there's some who become his eternal associates. 
So it depends on the pastime. Arjuna is his eternal associate. He appears whenever he, in the battle of Kurukshetra. Um, but it doesn't mention where they go, these same associates go from universe to universe to assist him. His eternal associates do, but not, but not everyone who associates with him in his pastimes, you know, comes from, goes with universe to universe. Only the Antonios, only the ones he brings with him when he, when he appears. So presumably Jay and Vijay have uh, uh, repeated appearances in all the planetary systems. <laughs> it's just not four times uh, that they have to appear. They have to appear perpetually four times in each, each of the universes. <laughs> it's it, it all gets a bit complicated, Maharaj, in my head, <laughs> in terms of working it all out. Yeah, well, the thing is, there's a principle called achintya. Achintya means inconceivable. So we can't conceive of everything but our limited understanding. But we know that the giant Vijay came in three manifestations on this planet, and then they became a fourth one. They also became Jagai and Mare in Lord Chaitanya's pastime. So, yeah. So, Lord Chaitanya's pastime is only on in Kali Yuga. Every once in every one thousand yuga cycles. So I, the obvious answer is some of the associates are always with the Lord and some become, some actually become his associates during that particular pastime. Okay. Um, Just like Srila Prabhupada, he's an eternal associate of, the, of Krishna in the spiritual world. So he appeared in this particular time period in this universe on this planet to do the work of the Lord. So where he is now, Prabhupada probably is preaching somewhere in another universe, and, uh, doing the same work somewhere. But he also has his identity in, in Goloka Vrindavan. Um, I'll ask one more question, Maris, and then I'll open the floor up for the people, otherwise I'll be hogging the, all the questions to myself. Um, Ganga appears through the piercing of Amanadev's toe uh, from the, um, the, the upper uh, planetary systems. Uh, how uh, and when does Bhagirati Muni, in relation to that, bring Ganga down then? Is that, is that a separate... Um, appearance of Ganga or is that in the different yeah there's, there's, three, there's, there's three manifestations of Ganga's appearance uh, the other one is described in the ninth canto due to the sons of Sagara when Am, Am, Amusam, Am, Amsuman uh, did penances austerities and brought the Ganga down but then Ganga was was so forceful that only uh, Janudweep, or what was his name, Bhagirata, that's why he's, she's called, she's also called the Janu. She's the daughter of uh, the sage Janu, who caught the Ganga when she came down. But ultimately it was Lord Shiva who accepted the Ganga on his head in order to stop the force of her waters, which went, could have went right through the earth and down into the lower planetary systems. So there's three different manifestations of Ganga mentioned. The one with Vamanadev, the one with Sangara, and then there's one more which I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Okay, how's that? That's all mentioned in the Bhagavatam. You can, you can get it there. 
so, so my question was, Maharaj, they, are, they, are they separate uh, manifestations or are they uh, within different yuga cycles? Uh, I would say they were in different yugas. But also because when the appearance of the Ganga, she can appear in different ways. Just like even when Krishna does the same pastime in another universe, it's not exactly the same. Prabhupada made that point. The general principles or the general activities are similar, but there's, many of the details are different. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Sorry, I've hoped so many questions. I'll, I'll, no, they're, I'll, they're good. No. No, they're good. It makes you think. It's I'll, I'll open it up initially to uh, um, my Sangha group. And then we can open it up uh, generally to the wider audience. So, uh, uh, Mimiran, do you have any questions for Maharaj? You're on mute, Mimiran. You left on mute. Still on mute. Okay. Can you allow unmuting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hello, Maharaj. Um, Hare Krishna. I have one question. Um, Lord Balaram, when he jumped into Jamuna River, uh, why did uh, Yamuna River not allow him? Uh, he was sporting with his gopis and he was intoxicated with Veroni beverage. <laughs> and so she didn't recognize him. Yeah, she was. She didn't recognize him. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Have but you... she came to her senses quite quickly. <laughs> oh, okay. I was... He was acting a little bit different than he normally does. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Hey. Thank you. Back. Do you have any questions? Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you very much for gracing us with your divine presence once again. I hope you're keeping well. My question is very minor. Um, thank you for taking the time to explain uh, the 10 uh, avatars. Uh, I, I just have a burning kind of question in my mind. Out of the 10 uh, avatars, which uh, is the most significant and has uh, impacted uh, 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 us in, in the most uh, profound way? Is there such a such a such a ranking as such? Well, the, the two that we give most prominence to, and for 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 very essential spiritual and religious reasons, are the appearance of Lord Ramachandra and the appearance of Lord Nishringadev. But. Uh, in gradations of spiritual exhibition of power, Ramachandra is superior. The Vaikuntha planets are aligned in such a way that they are they're going from down to up. And the highest of the high the highest of all the Vaikuntha planets is Ayodhya Dham, which is the abode of Lord Ramachandra in, in the spiritual world. Above Ayodhya Dham, you move into the, uh, the other realm of spirituality, and that is you go into Goloka Dham, where Krishna is above. Krishna is the original Supreme Personality of Godhead, and he manifests himself in different forms of himself in both uh, direct incarnations and in the Vaikuntha manifestations of himself. And, and what we were hearing today, the Leela avatars are all in the Vaikuntha men, except for Lord Balaram. So uh, out of those incarnations, uh, we give a very, um, a lot of attention to both Lord Balaram, Lord Shringadev, and Lord Ramachandra, all three. But uh, Lord Balaram and Lord Ramachandra are the most exalted, the most worshipable, the most uh, focused in Vaishnav culture. It's not just a general thing that we 
as a society focus on, but that's generally true throughout the whole Vaishnava world. There's such powerful Thank messages you. in Lord Ramachandra's appearance. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Jai Ho. Eleven, do you have any questions for Maharaj? She's on mute. Jay. Hari Bol Maharaj, thank you very much for gracing us again today. Um, I'm just, I'm not sure how to ask this question, but um, maybe I'm, uh, it's uh, the ninth avatar, the Buddha avatar. So that's the incarnation of Krishna. Um, am I right in thinking that um, there are no Vedas? Uh, so Buddha, um, I think Sey Seilu um, G mentioned something about that in one of our sessions. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I must have missed a few of the words. That I think were the question, <laughs> Maharaj, was that uh, um, Lord Buddha uh, renounced the Vedas. Um, and I think, as you explained, because of the animal killing, she's just getting clar asking for clarification as to uh, why the Vedas were renounced by Lord Buddha because people were using the Vedas in the wrong way okay. by sanctioning animal killing based on the Vedas. So he, he therefore Buddha is called Nindasi. I mean, that he, he rejected the Vedas just to get people off the Vedas. But then Sankaracharya appeared after Lord Buddha to put people back on the Vedas in, in monism. And then Ramanujacharya came and brought them even farther back, followed by Madhvacharya, and then Lord Chaitanya was the complete. So the Lord had a particular mission to play out, um, to get people from stop killing animals wholesale based on Vedic statements. Thank you, Maharaj. He's, he's called Nasik. Nasik means atheist. Okay. Thank you for explaining. And it was very nicely explained about all of the 10 avatars. Thank you so much. Hari Bol. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, so if uh, if anybody else has questions, I see there's already one hand up. Um, Gauri Sevika Mata, if you want to ask your question now, unmute, please. Thank you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Manam. Thank you so much for this lovely session. Maharaj, I had this question. Why is there such a vast gap of understanding between the Smartha's understanding and the understanding of Vaishnavas? Because in all throughout India, there is a conception always that Krishna is the avatar of Vishnu. And why do they have such different conception? And they think that Vaishnavas are some fanatics who think that Krishna is actually Vishnu is the avatar of Krishna and it's mentioned only in Vaishnava Shastra. So is it true? And how do we make them understand that? And why is there such conception in India majority? In majority? Why is that conception there? Yeah, and you find it in statements such as encyclopedias and other places of the that Krishna is the 14th or 7th incarnation of Vishnu. Because Krishna is too hard to understand. Vishnu comes as God. And he presents himself in that form. Krishna, he's also God, but he hides his godlike nature in his sweet Madhurya nature when he plays the role of a human being in Sri Vrindavan Dham. So they, uh, they attribute Krishna and his pastimes to being lesser and, but the Vaishnava scriptures, such as the Brahma Samhita, Ishwar Parma Krishna Sajjirananda Vigraha Anadi Radha Govinda Sarva Karna Karna, uh, really emphasizes the position of Krishna as the Adi Purush, Govinda Adi Purusha Tamaham Bajami. He is the source of all manifestations. So if you go through the scriptures, you'll find. Even in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Aham Adhi Devanam, I'm the source of all the demigods. 
Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo, I am, everything comes from me, both material and spiritual. Uh, eat, uh, what is that other verse uh, from the seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita? Um, uh, everything rests upon me as pearls are sp strung on a thread. Uh, so there's so many verses in the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Puranas, so many that emphasizes and clarifies Krishna's position as the Adi Purush, the supreme source of all manifestations of the God, and including the Vishnu forms. So, um, because they had they have a limited uh, uh, direction when they point to scripture, they point to Vishnu, and it's, sometimes it, it actually talks about that that uh, Vishnu is actually the supreme. He is the supreme, but he is the manifestation of the supreme, and therefore, unless you really go through the scriptures and study it in a critical way, you can come up with the wrong conclusions. Therefore, you need a spiritual master, or someone who is a self-realized soul to explain these things. Because yatavad tatapad, you can explain the scriptures in any darn way you want. <laughs> and that's what people do. And there's an old statement, it's, there's a statement by one American transcendentalist that says, both you and I read the Bible day and night, where you read black and I read white. Uh, so yeah, people can read scriptures and come up with their own conclusions. They see things according to their own understanding, and that's how, that's how life is. That's why there's so many people and so many different opinions. Everybody has their own under, understanding. But, if you want to know what trend real knowledge is, you have to go to authority. And the scripture is a part of that authority, but the understanding of the scripture given by the self-realized souls makes the knowledge complete and correct. Therefore, you have to find a self-realized soul, the one who lives the scriptures and knows the scriptures. Otherwise, you can, even anybody who's got some intelligence, who learns the scriptures, in other words, who memorizes it, can come up with their own conclusions. It's not, and it can be very convincing. And they can quote verses in order to support their theories. But ultimately you have to come up with, you have to have it, you have to have a pure devotee of the Lord who is 7% engaged in devotional service to the Lord. So, yeah. They see Vishnu, they doesn't so much present himself as a Supreme Lord when he performs his pastimes in Vrindavan. Although he does superhuman activities like lifting over Don Hill and killing demons, still at the same time, he acts like a little child to his parents. He's the friend of his uh, cowherd friends. He's the sport young girls. He does anything ordinary people do to something lesser as a manifestation of the Godhead. Same with you know, people when they compare Ram Chandra with Lord Krishna. People, more people worship Ram Chandra than they worship Krishna. Although Krishna, Lamadi Murti Sukalani Ame Natishtana Navatara Akara Bhubaneshu Kintu, Krishna Swayam Savavavat Paramam Paman Yo Vindamari Purusham Tama. It explains in this that Ram is actually the chief manifestation of the incarnations of Krishna. So, yeah, but people worship Ram because Ram presents himself as the supreme personality of God and in all his glory and all his qualities. Krishna doesn't do that. Krishna is mysterious. He acts the way he wants to act. <laughs> He's not, he doesn't fit in anyone's category. That's why in 700 interpretations of the Bhagavad Gita, 
And how many of those interpretations actually give Krishna his right position? They think he's an incarnation. They think he's a very powerful manifestation. Sometimes they think he's just mythological. So unless you have a pure devotee who can, who is fully engaged in devotional service, who can explain the scriptures clearly based on the knowledge that is available, you will get fooled. Therefore, you have so many, many, many ideas. <laughs> So the Vaishnavas take the essence of the scriptures as given by the Acharyas and which point to overwhelmingly that Krishna is the supreme, the Adi Purush, Govindam Adi Purush, not just Purush, Adi, Adi Purush. E te chum sam kalam pum sam Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. It's mentioned that after all the incarnations and manifestations of the Vishnu and Orion forms, are described in the in the first canto, third chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam. It comes to the 28th verse in that chapter. And it says, Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. He is the source of all manifestations, the plenary portions and portions of the plenary portion incarnations. He is the Adi Purush. So it takes a lot of time and effort and study, but if you go right to a pure devotee and get the explanations given by them, and then you practice devotional service, you will understand. In Maharaj, uh, as it is mentioned, uh, Sri Krishna as Bhagwan, but then in Srimad Bhagavatam, he is also categorized as one of the of the guna so he is in that category as well so how do we understand that because it's like he is the supreme bhagwan and then all uh, and Vish all. vishnu was vishnu was considered one of the guna avatars not krishna okay i heard it, it from a lecture of amoglila prabhuji on bhagavad gita so like he was making the entire chart so from there he was mentioning that some people also can categorize him Krishna as Bhagwan as well as a guna avatar of Vishnu. So that's why I got no, a little bit confused. That's, that's incorrect. No, it's mentioned that three guna avatars are Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. And Vishnu is the manifestation for maintenance. Brahma for creation, Shiva for destruction. They're the three guna avatars. Not Krishna, Vishnu. That's mentioned directly in the Shastra. Uh, I'm sorry, Maharaj. It was not Guna after, it was Leela after. I just, it was a slip, slip of tongue. So, like in both the categories. Well, where, where is it? It doesn't mention Krishna as one of the direct in Leela avatars. It mentions that he is the source of these Leela avatars. The only one that's. Hmm, Mention is that in the, the last one, which is Kalki Avatar, which is a Narayan manifestation of the Supreme Lord. If you read the uh, 20th chapter of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Lord Chaitanya explains in detail to Sanatana Goswami all of the manifestations and incarnations of the Lord and their different categories. And you, you can see that Swamsa, Bibinamsa, and uh, Kala, there's so many aspects to incarnation. But when it all comes to the summation, it's Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. He is the manifestation. So he may appear in different ways, in different forms of himself. But when he appears as Krishna, he's Krishna in Vrindavan. He doesn't appear in any other way. Unless he goes to Dwarka, well, that's the same Leela. He's Krishna in Madura, Krishna in Dwarka, and Krishna in Vrindavan. But not as a Leela avatar. He's not he's not mentioned as one of the Leela avatars. He is Avatar E. He is the source of all avatars. Thanks for clarification, Maharaj. And also, where would we categorize other incarnations like Badrinath or uh, Vithal or Venkateshwar Balaji and all other, and even Vedvyas or you know, all other incarnations? 
Well, yeah, there's different. And Veda Vyas is the Shaktivesha avatar. Badri, Badri Nath, Badri Vishal, he's, that's also a Vishnu manifestation of the Lord. Um, but they appear in different forms of themselves. Sometimes they appear with two arms, sometimes they appear with four arms. What are some of the other ones you mentioned? Uh, Vithala and Venkateshwar, who is very commonly worshipped in the south, southern region. Yeah, Venkateshwar is Balaji, <laughs> it's Krishna. Yeah. And, so they uh, were categorized as demigods, isn't it? They are like the avatars of Krishna. Not demigods, they're, they're just manifestation of Krishna for a certain Leela. That whole Leela of... Uh, the Venkateshwara was, um, that's a long Leela when, when that when uh, Brigamuni wanted to find out the real incarnation, he found actually it was Vishnu, Brahman, Shiva, Vishnu incarnated as Srinivas, and then there's a whole pastime how he actually manifested himself as uh, Venkateshwara. That whole Leela is there in the in the Babaji temple. You can see it on the walls. They describe it. They describe it in pictures. So it's actually uh, Vishnu. It's actually Vishnu. And what about Jagannath? Like because no, Jagannath, Jagannath is Krishna directly. Mm -hmm. Krishna. Yeah, that's Krishna and his manifestation of separation in the mood of Vrindavan Dham, that is Jagannath. When Jagannath, when the Lord went to Dwarka in order, and Mathura first and then Dwarka, in order to take care of political affairs, he was away from Vrindavan for many years. So that separation, which is the expression of the mood of Vrindavan, where the Lord is separated from his loving devotees and the devotees are separated from him. That manifestation, that's the whole Jagannath Rathyatra. Jagannath Rathyatra is Krishna's leaving Dwarka and returning to Vrindavan. Because if you go to Jagannath Puri, you'll see that the, the Jagannath temple is considered to be Vaikuntha and uh, the Gundicha temple is considered to be Rindavan, and then that, that's the Ratha car. It goes from the Jagannath temple to the Gundicha temple. Krishna leaves uh, Dwarka and he comes to Rindavan like that. That's a beautiful, beautiful path. So Jagannath is Krishna directly. He's non different than Krishna. He's not an he's not an incarnation of Krishna. He's he's Krishna appearing in a different form of himself. That's all. In Maharaj, some devotee told me about this uh, Gita that was sung by Lord Shiva as well. I don't know what that is called, but there was a PDF on that, and I'm not sure if that is authentic. So I just wanted to clear because it it goes in the same pattern, and it's just Lord Shiva and some other devotee, just like Arjuna, and then he gives. Uh, and the verses are also similar in that uh, Gita, which I noticed. But then I don't know if it's authentic or not. Like I have never heard about this Shiva Gita or anything like that. And he also mentions I am the supreme there, and like so some people fight that oh we don't know because the same Gita is in the similar terms and like tone it is spoken by Lord Shiva that I am the supreme and everything rests upon me so you I'm not sure to, you have to understand what is being uh, what is being explained here is that there are people in different categories of life there are people who function in the mode of ignorance there's people who function in the mode of passion people who function in the mode of goodness and people who function in the mode of transcendence above the three modes. So you'll find in the Agni Purana, Agni sometimes is given the position as the Supreme. In the Shiva Purana, also Shiva is given the position as Supreme. That's to get people who are in those lower modes to worship these manifestations so they can raise themselves up from the lower modes to a higher mode and eventually come to the higher platform. So this is a, 
a way to elevate people. That's why you need understanding of the Shastras. This is the Acharya's explanations that not everyone can worship Krishna. Krishna is very difficult to follow. Krishna is difficult. But people can follow Shiva. Shiva is much easier. And he's called Asutos. He's easy, please, and easy. But who is his followers? Bhutas, Pratas, people in lower categories like that. He shocks he picks up these people, gives them a chance because he's a great devotee of the Lord, Vaishnavad Yata Shambhu. Then if they worship Lord Shiva, they elevate themselves from the lower modes to a higher mode. That's the same thing Buddha did when he got people off the Vedas so they wouldn't continue to make offenses by killing living entities based on the Vedas. Although Buddha is Krishna himself, he appeared as Gnostic, he appeared as an atheist in order to elevate people from their, uh, or to get people off their sinful activities and get them back uh, towards the right understanding. And then later on in history, as the Lord appears, not the Lord, but the Lord's in, uh, devotees appear in different manifestations, they teach higher and higher principles. So if you read the verse, Vedas, and without without Guru, you can come up with your own conclusions. It's not hard. Whatever conclusion you want, you can look for it in the Vedas. The Vedas are like a desire tree. Nigava Kalpataro, Palitam Galam. They're a desire tree. And Maharaj, as it is mentioned, as you Mata, can, I, uh, can I just uh, ask if anybody else has questions first? Then, if they don't, I'll come back to you. Yeah, so I'll just ask if anybody else has questions. They can raise their hands. Uh, otherwise, we'll we'll kind of be going to, to the same sort of points again. Yeah, so I'm if so you can just, so I'll just yeah. ask everybody else. If nobody has questions, then we can come back to you again. Okay. 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 Sorry. So sorry. Anybody, if you have questions, please raise your hand. Mm. No questions for me. I'm still mad. I'm just tired now. <laughs> Does the, any of uh, other marriages, other disciples have any questions or? Uh, no questions. Sri Devi, you have a question? Sorry, yes. <laughs> Hi, Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my. Humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to your holiness. Um, I'm listening to this uh, Dashavatara uh, and I'm thinking about Lord Chaitanya. Of course, he's Lord Krishna himself, come as the covered uh, Chana avatar. And I was wondering if you would like to speak a little bit because this is our, you know, our time, our Yuga avatar. And if you could just speak a little bit about Lord Chaitanya too. Hi. He's a mysterious incarnation. He is he is Krishna with the internal mood of Lord uh, with the internal mood of Radharani. He's Krishna Rindavan. He's playing the part of a devotee. He doesn't present himself in any way as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's teaching highest religious principles from the position of pure devotional service. <laughs> By playing the part of a pure devotee of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the easiest and most direct and most recommended way to worship Lord Chaitanya is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Now, according to scriptures, Goloka Prema Dan Harinam Sankirtan Ratin Jan Milo Kene Upai. This this chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is coming directly from Goloka Rindavan. So he's a he is the Lord, with the Lord's internal mood as a devotee, teaching the highest principle of worshiping Krishna in Vrindavan through elevating oneself through the process of Harinam Sankirtan.
Thank you and very taught, much. Taught many other principles, but this is the essence. <laughs> and as you were describing all the other avatars, I was just thinking how fortunate we are that the Lord has made it so easy for us, you know, he just wants us to chant his names and make our lives perfect. Uh, well, yeah, Kalir Doshani De Rajan Asti Aku Mahagun Kirtana Eva Krishna Sya Mukta Sangam Phalam Bhujan. Every age there is a way for self-realization. So this is the means in this particular age. <laughs> According to the quality of the age, a particular type of spiritual practice is enunciated by the Lord Himself. So this is the enunciation. Harinam Sankirtan. Iti soda sukam namna kali kama sanasanam nata parayo tayo sarva veda shudrishite. After searching through all the Vedas, one cannot find a more simple, sublime, and direct process of self-realization in this age of Kali than chanting these 16 names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, 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 Rama Hare Hare. <laughs> Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. That's from Kali Santara Upanishad, spoken by Lord Brahma. Jai. Thank you. Beautiful narration of the Shavatar. It's uh, just, uh, you know, it's like a movie display, you know, one after the other, as you were describing. We're just seeing the Lord in all the beautiful, various forms that He has taken. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you. It was such a wonderful session. It really was. I would like to offer my thanks to, to you, Maharaj, for your time and uh, beautiful narration of the uh, the avatars and uh, clarification. I would just like to add to, to uh, your explanations, Maharaj, where Krishna says in 10.8 of Gita, Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo, there is no way anybody can misinterpret. He says, I am the source of everything. And yet people still misinterpret that. I don't understand how. Yes. There is no fear of that about who he is. And, but uh, still people misinterpret it. It's unbelievable. Yeah, because... If you're looking for a particular result, you'll focus on finding that. <laughs> he also says, Sarvasya jaham vridhisani vistam matat smirtir gyanam alpohanam chah vedaisa sarham aham eva vedyo vedanta krit veda vidheva chaham. The last part of that verse, he says, I am the compiler of the Vedas. I am the knower of the Vedas, and the Vedas are meant to know me. He establishes his position so very clearly. Yes. And we're uh, very fortunate to, 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 to be in the, in the, uh, the shelter uh, of Srila Prabhupada's uh, books. They are so clear and so crystal clear. Everything is made so precisely clear it's uh yeah it's just unbelievable how fortunate we are to yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. thank you Maharaj once Maharaj. again if I everyone can yes do thank you Guru Maharaj thank you Hare Krishna thank you Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna